All right, folks, welcome back to the fourth video tutorial in this kinetics topic. And, and we're going to look at um, how do you determine the order of a reaction. And of course, so far, we've met these various equations that you can see on the screen. So we've got rate laws, we've got integrated rate laws. Oh, cripes, there's so much to know. How do I know when to use each of these equations? Well, first of all, you need to know what the order of the reaction is, or the order of the kinetics. Okay, Chris, well, that's all well and good, but how do I work out the order of the reaction? So let's talk about that a bit, shall we? There's actually two methods you should be aware of for determining the order of a reaction. And it really depends on what sort of data you have at your disposal. So the first method we'll discuss is known as the method of initial rates. This method can be used when you have data about the initial concentration of the reactants, the initial rates of the reaction, and you've actually performed the reaction several times using a variation of concentrations. And in this case, we can use the rate laws. So if we take this example, I've taken this straight from the lecture notes, but we'll just go through it one more time. For the reaction where carbon monoxide reacts with bromine gas to form COBr2, evaluate the order with respect to both of those reagents and calculate the reaction rate constant. Okay, so there's a couple of questions there. Determine the order with respect to each of the reactants. And then the second part of the question is calculate the rate constant. So if we're going to use the method of initial rates, what we have to do is perform the same reaction a number of times and vary the concentration. Now for a reaction like this where we have more than one reactant, which I guess is, you know, most reactions are going to have more than one reactant. Not all reaction, reactions do. It might just be the isomerization reaction or something or other. But in most cases you have more than one reactant. So you actually have to set this experiment up quite quite intelligently and the first thing that you'll notice is for the first three times we've run this experiment and I'll just get some ink here you can see we've actually held the concentration of one of the reactants constant and it's actually the second of the reactants carbon monoxide where we've slightly varied it each time we've run the experiment and you can see that as we go from 0.5 molar to 1 molar to 2 molar, the rate of the reaction actually follows this proportionally. Okay, So as we go from a concentration of 0.5 to 1.0, in other words, we've doubled the concentration, you can see that the rate of the reaction has gone from 0.1 to 0.2. It's doubled as well. Then when we double that again, we go from 1.0 to 2.0, you can see that the rate again doubles. Okay, This is a sign that it's first order kinetics with respect to that reactant, so carbon monoxide. Second time we perform the experiment, we actually hold the concentration of carbon monoxide as a constant and vary the other reagent, so the bromine. In this case, as we double the concentration of bromine, you can see that the rate actually quadruples. And as we triple the concentration from the initial concentration, the rate increases nine times. In other words, three squared. So it's second order with respect to bromine. To calculate the rate constant, you can substitute any of these experiments into the rate law that you just established, which was this guy here second order with respect to bromine and first order with respect to carbon monoxide. And you can get a value for K. And what you'll actually find is if you substitute any of those values into that equation, you will get the same value for K. Because of course at a constant temperature, K does not change. The second method we'll discuss uses integrated rate laws. And this is when you have a different kind of data set. So this method can be used when you have data about the initial concentration of a reactant, the concentration of a reactant after some time t, and in fact several measurements of the concentration have been taken at different times. 
In this case, we'll use the integrated rate law. And there are three versions of this that you should be aware of. And here they are here. In our previous video tutorial, we saw a few plots, and I'll just reproduce these here, and we'll get some kind of color coding going on. So in this case here, if we plot the concentration by time, we'll get a plot which gives you a straight line. What about for the first order kinetics? Let's um, just flip across to our red color here. Now, what if we plot a concentration by time here? What happens? It starts up here somewhere and it's decreasing, but the rate actually the rate of change decreases as time goes on because it's proportional to the concentration of that reactant. In other words, it's got a different plot. To get a linear plot for first order kinetics, we can actually turn to the integrated rate law, which kind of indicates that if we were to plot the log of the concentration, it would actually look a little bit different. Why is that the case? Because in this form, it really has that kind of y equals mx, that linear equation form. We see a similar thing over here for second order kinetics, but in this case, we have to plot the reciprocal of the concentration over time. So 1 over, and you can see this comes directly from the integrated rate law. This will give you a different kind of plot because k is positive in this case, or I should say it's expressed in a positive form in that equation. So if you have this kind of data where you might have multiple um, points which you can plot as concentration changes with time, you can actually determine whether or not you've got zero, first or second order kinetics. Let's have a look at an example of this. We've got some reaction here where um, I've performed some experiment and A turns into some sort of product. It doesn't matter what the products are because we're just going to focus on the change in the concentration of that reactant A with time. Now, if I was going to plot this uh, and I asked myself the question, is this zero order kinetics? And what have I got? Orange. Okay, so if we had zero order kinetics, what we should find is that if we plot the concentration by time, then we should get a straight line. And if we have a look at kind of, you know, I'll just try and jot this as, uh, as accurately as possible. So when time equals zero, and what have we got? We've got 50 seconds across the bottom here. You can see this is very crude, but it'll, it'll certainly show us pretty quickly. So as time is zero, we've got a data point here. When time is at 10 seconds, we've got a data point kind of here somewhere. Um, when time is 20 seconds, We've got a data point kind of here at 30 seconds. I reckon it's probably up there somewhere. 40 seconds. Yeah, it's probably about there somewhere. And 50 seconds. Yeah, it's probably, what is it, 0.5. So if we plot this, I would say that's not really a straight line. Wouldn't you? Let's see what happens if we plot the the other data. Now what have we got here? We've got, um, this is the log of the concentration as time changes. So let's go to uh, green to match our data. So if this was first order kinetics and we were to plot the log of the concentration, uh, we should see this as a straight line. So our data kind of, we've got some weird looking data here. It um, kind of goes up 2.3, 2.1, 1.9. Um, all right, so when time is zero, we see the log, the concentration is there. When time is, what do we got? Uh, put some little time markers on our x-axis. You can see it's, I'll 
kind of being very cheeky here because I've set this up in a convenient way to, to make sense. Um, but I've got, most importantly, I've got, whoops, that's a data point there. You can see that's giving me a perfectly linear plot. And in fact, probably just by looking at the numbers in, in that column there, you probably clearly see that uh, as time jumped in equal increments, the log of the concentration was also jumping in equal increments. I'd say this pretty unambiguously proves that this data set here corresponds to first order kinetics. But let's just see what happens if we test for second order kinetics. And we'll go to a blue color, ink color, what have we got here? So in this case, if we were, if this really was second order kinetics, and we plotted one over the concentration as time changes, as we go from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 seconds, perfectly linear there Chris and on our scale we really need to go from we'll make it go from 0 to to 18 and we've got kind of 6 and 12 there along the way um, when time is at 0 we have a value with data point about there when time is at uh, 10 seconds uh, we've got a data point which is sorry, probably about there and 20 seconds, so don't forget we've got some numbers down the bottom here. So I'm just doing a rush job here, but I think hopefully as you as we go, you sort of see this crystallizing after 30 seconds. We've kind of got a data point here. After 40 seconds, it's starting to ramp up pretty quickly. And we've got a data point here. And I think you can see that's starting to curve up. Okay, I'd say from those three tests we've just done, that was unambiguously first order kinetics. And so that's the way that you could test uh, using the integrated rate law form, whether or not you've got zero, first or second order kinetics. All right, that's enough for the time being. I'll see you guys in video tutorial number five.